See, here's the title of this talk. You tell me, I have no idea how I got into this. This is the title of the talk. It's in your program. The Battle for the Future. Okay, that's pretty clear, right? Millet, Ukraine, Trump, Israel, America, Europe, and all that. I have no idea what anybody was thinking when they came up with that title. It wasn't my title, believe me. I, don't do, I wouldn't do that to myself. But there you go. Good luck, Good luck thank you. <laughs> so I'm actually going to start somewhere else. I'm going to start here in Amsterdam rather than to try to take on that list. We'll get to that list later. I mean, I, I love this city, and I'm, I'm happy that there's an objectives conference here, and I'll talk about Amsterdam specifically tomorrow. We've got a whole talk about it. But one of the things that Amsterdam, I think, represents and should represent in our mind, and if you study history a little bit, Amsterdam, to a large extent, can be viewed as the birthplace of the Enlightenment. Amsterdam represents the turning from the Renaissance to an Enlightenment that really develops in France and in England and in Scotland, but it, everything goes through right where we are now. Really, many of the first thinkers of the Enlightenment, the beginning of the Enlightenment, the real radicals of the Enlightenment, are here. Amsterdam is where almost all the publishing houses that ultimately publish the texts of the Enlightenment, that are too radical to be published in Paris or in London, this is where they're published. So Amsterdam has a unique historical significance if we value liberty, if we value freedom, and again, I'll talk about it more tomorrow. But I think that's a good entryway into what I think is really, really important if we want to understand the world in which we live today. And that is an entryway into the Enlightenment. In, in, a, in a sense, the Enlightenment is what, when we talk about Western civilization, is really intellectually what we're talking about. The Enlightenment is intellectually the most crucial period in the West history other than Greece, which of course inspires the Renaissance and then the Enlightenment. But in terms of what's happening in Europe, the Enlightenment is where the ideas, the good ideas that we have today in the West come from. And all the battles, that long list of bad stuff that's happening in the world, is really an anti-enlightenment constant force. There is a battle going on in the West between the enlightenment and the anti-enlightenment, and it's been going on since the enlightenment. So what is the enlightenment? What does it represent? What are the ideas that come out of the enlightenment that are then challenged and are constantly under attack? And today you see that attack on a scale maybe we haven't seen maybe since World War II. But what, are the, what does the Enlightenment represent? It represents a decline and demise of religion, but more fundamentally, a decline and demise of faith as the source of knowledge. The idea of the Enlightenment is that reason is where we get knowledge from. Maybe they didn't have a full, we know they didn't have a full conception of reason, a full conception of what rationality meant, that only Ayn Rand has, and in every one of these respects, Ayn Rand completes the project that is the Enlightenment. But they clearly have a view that to understand the world, we need reason, we need perception, we need to view the world out there, and we need cognition. We don't get truth from revelation. And they're rejecting faith, not completely, not in any in every realm of life, but in a significant portion of life. So it's the rebirth of reason. It's not an accident that the Enlightenment is often called the age of reason. The age of reason and the age of science. And science and reason, of course, go together. You know, one of the Amsterdam, right? So, so you, we have here the philosopher Spinoza, who's part of that movement, away from faith, towards reason. So reason is definitely a concept, an idea, the efficacy of reason, the importance of reason. Reason as our means, as human beings of knowing reality, comes from the Enlightenment. And if there's an understanding that the entity that reasons is the individual. 
And the value of the individual, again, comes out of the enlightenment. It's a period in which individuals are liberated to start making decisions for themselves. This is a period in which people are thinking for themselves, acting, pursuing their own values, their own interests. It's the shattering of the idea that you know, the, the community can decide who you should marry, what profession you should have, what values you should pursue, what you should believe. And suddenly, the idea that individuals should be able to decide for themselves who to marry, what career to pursue, and ultimately, who their political leaders should be. So coming out of the Enlightenment is a concept, again, somewhat primitive, particularly when you come from the perspective of Ayn Rand, of individualism, there's even an attempt to figure out how do we get morality if it's not from God? How do we get from morality from reason? That They don't do a good job at it, but they're trying. And it's not an accident that in the Declaration of Independence, the American Declaration of Independence, there's an inalienable right to pursue happiness. Happiness as an individual. Your happiness. That's individualism. There's, that's the beginning of self-interest. That's the beginning... Or maybe the right. It, it, there's real egoism there, even if they can't articulate it as a moral theory. The orientation is already towards that. That's coming out of the Enlightenment, individualism. And finally, of course, the consequence of individualism is political. And the consequence of an individualistic perspective politically is political freedom. And the Enlightenment is this period where they're advocating. They're starting to challenge the prevailing view of politics, kings and, uh, and aristocracy and that whole notion. And you get both out of the Scottish Enlightenment, but primarily out of the French Enlightenment, this real suspicion of aristocracy, this real suspicion of kings and the demands, the beginning of demands for a republic, for individuals being able to choose their political leaders. And of course, what you get is the key political concept, the key political concept that we all understand is at the heart of politics, which is what? What's the beginning, the key concept for politics? Rights. rights, individual rights, right? Individual rights, that's the bridge between individualism and the political is individual rights. And that's John Locke, right? And even before John Locke, a little bit, there's the beginning of it here in Amsterdam with uh, Grotius, Grotius, how do you pronounce it? Oh, forget about it. I'm not going to even try to do that, but that guy. <laughs> and again, he doesn't have full conception, but this is the beginning. That they're, they're working on this concept of rights and what it means and what implications it has for politics. And of course, by the time you get to the founding fathers, 1776, now you've got a theory and you've got a political application and America is the crowning achievement of the Enlightenment in terms of pol politics. It is the manifestation of it. And the Declaration of Independence, the greatest document, political document I think ever written, is a manifestation of that Enlightenment. So here you have a whole system built on reason, individualism, and political liberty, individual rights. That's what the Enlightenment is. And really, that is what Western civilization is. That's the essence of civilization. That is when we're talking about what we're fighting for. That's what we're fighting for. We're fighting for a deeper understanding of that because Ayn Rand has completed all of those and given us a much more solid foundation for all of those concepts. But it is those concepts that we're fighting for. It is those ideas that are crucial to maintaining civilization. It is what civilization means today. And Ankar talked about how amazing the world around us is, and it is. I mean, it's, again, easy, and my list reinforces, it's easy to focus on all the negatives. But, you know, who's holding up his phone up there and videotaping me, you know? Um, it is amazing. You know, yeah, I've got the iPhone. Um, <laughs> had to pull it out at some point, right? I mean, this stuff is amazing. We live in a time that is truly spectacular in terms of our ability to live, our ability to exercise our will, our ability to, uh, to pursue our values. Yes, there are lots of limitations and we can focus on all the bad and all the constraints and all. But 
why? You know, we can also focus on all the positives. From a historical perspective, there's never been a better time to be alive. Intellectually, the Enlightenment, the 19th century, and, and Greece were greater. Artistically, the 19th century was greater, but and, and many centuries were greater. But, you know, I can enjoy all that art today. So there are no modern artists that are creating anything like that. Okay, but I can still enjoy all that art today, and I can enjoy all that art today because I can get on an airplane and go there. I can enjoy all that art today because I can go on the internet and search it and experience it. I can even go to a company and ask them to print me out a copy of my favorite painting. And you'll get an oil painting, a, a replica of your favorite painting put up on your wall. It doesn't cost that much money. These are truly amazing things. But that's all, and it's important to understand that all of that, the science, the technology, the entrepreneurship, and the acceptance in our society, at least to some extent, of the fact that each one of us is pursuing happiness, the acceptance of that, that's the enlightenment. That's the remnants of the enlightenment in our culture that's still alive and well. Every time an entrepreneur starts a company, taking risks based on his own ideas, without asking for permission from the prince or the king or whatever. That's the enlightenment. Now, that, again, it's not perfect, but we should appreciate what we have and we should appreciate where it comes from. So that's the positive. And the positive is all grounded in those ideas. Now, from the beginning, the enlightenment is challenged. From the beginning, the anti-enlightenment forces rise up. Initially, it's a philosophical objection. Initially, it's an attack both from philosophy and from religion. The attack from religion is not particularly powerful. But what is powerful is the attack from philosophy. And you can talk to the philosophers about why the attack from philosophy was so successful, what the holes were in the enlightenment. We're not going to get into that. But from Immanuel Kant to Hegel to Schopenhauer to Marx, to the whole string of mostly German philosophers, they attack and demolish these ideas of reason. We, Ankar mentioned it earlier, right? But undermining reason, right? Kant turning reason upside down. Yeah, you can do it. It just doesn't reflect anything about the real world. It doesn't reflect anything about reality. They attack reason. They attack individualism. We're all one, Hegel says, right? I mean, there's no individual. Marx, and they attack, of course, political freedom, political liberty. And the consequence, once you get rid of individualism, is going to be authoritarianism. Now, it takes ideas time to manifest themselves in human action and in political action. So the really, really bad ideas that come post-enlightenment, they're attacking the enlightenment, don't really have an impact in the 19th century or don't have as much of an impact in the 19th century. In the 19th century, there's the energy, the spirit of the Enlightenment. It's the Industrial Revolution. It's taking those Enlightenment ideas and manifesting themselves in people's lives and building and creating. People too excited. What are they excited about? They're free. Maybe for the first time in human history, people are free. They go out there and they can invent, they can produce, they can build, they can create. This has never happened before. They don't need to ask for permission. It's for a brief period, there's a permissionless society. So the enlightenment is manifest in this 19th century. Not fully, not consistently with all the caveats associated with it, but to a greater extent than in ever in human history, really, in terms of the freedom individuals can express and go out there and build and create and make. But in the background, the intellectuals are striving against. And the real, the real effect of the anti-enlightenment is really not felt until the 20th century, right? And in the 20th century, you get the full impact of what that means. And that's World War I, and that's World War II. That's the rise of communism and the rise of fascism. And ultimately, the rise of the mixed economy. But really, fascism and communism are direct attacks 
on the Enlightenment in politics. They're direct attacks on Western civilization. They arise from the West, but they're anti-Western. They're anti-civilizational forces. They want, in that sense, they're reactionary forces. They're trying to take us back to an era from before the Enlightenment, from before the discovery of the efficacy of reason. Communism denies it, really, if you understand what they talk about when they even say the word reason. Fascism denies reason. Suddenly they both deny individualism and suddenly both deny political freedom. So fascism and, uh, and communism are direct attacks at the Enlightenment and direct attacks at Western civilization. And they're defeated. Thoroughly, systematically, they're defeated. They're crushed. And yet by the time they're crushed, our understanding in the West of the ideas that made the West possible is dramatically diminished. So we know we kind of won, but we don't know why. We know we kind of won, but we don't understand where that comes from. In the West, we cling maybe to the idea of political freedom, but we don't really understand its value because we've lost individualism and we've lost reason. Our intellectuals no longer advocate for individualism and reason. So all we have is kind of a, a, a mushy conception of what political freedom actually means, and it's turned into much more of a democracy than it was originally thought of as an individual rights-based republic. The concept of individual rights is lost to a large extent. I mean, remnants survive in America because America has a constitution. So they can, you know, why they're textualists? Why are they originalists on the Supreme Court of America? The conservatives became originalists and textualists. Because they don't understand the concepts. So they go by the words. Oh, what did this mean in the 17th, 18th century? Oh, okay, that's what it means, right? They, can't, they don't have a conceptual understanding of individual rights and how to apply it. So they follow the exact wording of the thing. Oh, uh, abortion, it doesn't say here there's a right to abortion in the Bill of Rights. And uh, they had this attitude in the, to abortion in the 18th century. Therefore, oh, abortion must not be protected. Because they can't understand the idea of individual rights and therefore how it would apply to all these circumstances unless it's written down. That's how non-conceptual our most, you know, smartest judges in the United States are. Not very smart in terms of their conceptual understanding of the document they're supposed to be protecting. Right? So here we have a situation where Collectivism in its most um, consistent forms, if you will, communism, fascism, are demolished. But the West doesn't really know why they were demolished. It doesn't really know what it is, what it stands for, what values it represents. It doesn't see the historical link with the Enlightenment and what those ideas that came out of there that are driving whatever good is still in the West. They've they're still doing it. We're still acting on it, right? They're still entrepreneurs. There's still science to a large extent, right? And we're still pursuing happiness somewhat, a little bit. People out there seeking self-help and all this stuff. But there's no intellectual understanding of any of that. So this, the, weak, the, 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 the West, to the extent there's Western civilization, is weakening. And it's constantly weakening. But the forces that are anti-enlightenment are still out there. They haven't gone away. They're weaker too. There's no integrated idea like communism anymore. It's like this flaky woke stuff, right? And, and, and nobody really likes and There's no, no real understanding of how it integrates into everything. But people do it out of a sense of guilt because it's associated with certain things that are bad in the past and racism and so on. But, but they don't understand it. They don't have a passion around it except for a small minority. And that's why every time it comes up for a vote, it's voted down. Majority of people don't like it. And, you know, so you've got this, this the left is, is churning anti-Western civilization stuff, but it's not geared towards any kind of grand ideology that integrates it all like communism was. And even on the right, at best what they have, the best integrating source they have on the right is what? What's that? Is religion. 
So they have to go way back to before the Enlightenment to bring forward their source for, for the for their anti-Enlightenment ideas. But they are growing in strength because the people advocating for Enlightenment ideas don't know what they're advocating for. There's a weakness, a fundamental weakness. So even though our enemies, I think, are weak, pathetic, really. I mean, the left is pathetic. I mean, long gone is the scientific uh, views of Marx that actually had a system and uh, you know a whole philosophy and a view of man. Now it's just completely haphazard, disintegrated, it, to some extent, nonsense. And on the right... Gone is any kind of, again, system and, and even, even an idea of, of statism. All they have is religion. So what do you have today? You have Putin. A thug. A thug. Who doesn't stand for it? What's the ideology of Putin? I mean, there's nationalism, but where does, where does he get the nationalism from? Is it, is it some... A core philosophical thing. I mean, if you ever listen to Dugin, which is one of the philosophers, I mean, it's gibbly, gibbly grooves. I mean, it's nonsense. It's harkening back to mysticism. There's no set of ideas here. There's no philosophy. There's, I mean, there's a philosophy, but it's kind of an implicit, mystical, ancient philosophy. This is why when he sits down with Taka, uh, he doesn't articulate, here's my view of how the world should work. This no, he starts telling him stories about what the Russians were at 800, and and uh, you know what 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 the Rus were and the Kiev and this and that. Who cares? I mean, it's interesting if, if you did it objectively, which he doesn't. But he he has no. All he has is history. All he has is mysticism. All he has is a vague notion of I hate the West. I'm anti-reason, anti-individualism, anti-political freedom. He can't say that, but that's all he's proposing. Or if you take Hamas, right? I'm supposed to do Israel, right? I think it was on the list. Um, I mean, what do they have? What are they proposing? Mysticism, an ancient religion, a religion that never was reformed, never went through an enlightenment, never was modified, just Jihadism, this is about establishing a global jihad. This is about establishing Sharia law in the world. That's what motivates. That's what drives Hamas. If you read the actual papers, they don't care about a, a state. They don't believe in states. They believe in a one big jihadist world. They're part of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is an international organization that believes in taking over the world. They take this stuff seriously. But again, it's a primitive religion. There's nothing more there than primitive religion. Do I have to talk about Trump? It was on the list. But, look, you know, look at our political candidates in America running right now. Trump and Biden. What do they represent? Nothing? I think is pretty much right. right? Again, Trump represents some hearkening to, to, to some national, vague nationalism, uh, which is really foreign to Americans. It's not exactly clear what it actually means. There's no thousand year history that he can go to and there's no so so he just it's 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 just promising the popular you know it's populism in the sense of figuring out what gets people excited and they clap a lot and saying that and he'll change his mind like that if the audience responds differently to what he says because he stands for absolutely nothing there's no ideas there's, there's no ideology and what does biden stand for nothing what's that i didn't hear Dementia. Oh, dementia. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the funny thing about Biden is that uh, if, you, if you go back and watch him when he was a senator, he was just as incoherent <laughs> and just as babbling as he is now. So I don't know that it's dementia as much as it's Biden. He was never that coherent to begin with. Uh, but he, again, he represents nothing. There's no ideology there. Again, there's an acceptance, a kind of mixed economy of neither here nor there, of a little bit of everything, a vague notion of we're pro-democracy, but nothing. Nothing really. But what do they want? They clearly, all these forces, what are they against? They're against each other, kind of, and they, yet they agree on so much. 
What they're really against is the Enlightenment. What they're really against is reason, individualism, and, and true political liberty, individual rights. But notice that the, the forces against are kind of bubbling idiots. But that's who dominates our political landscape. I mean, what does the European Union stand for? Nothing. Kind of a, a vague notion of we want to maintain political liberty, but we don't really know what that is, and certainly there's no concept of individual rights, and we certainly don't want any individualism. And So what you have today is nothing versus nothing. And the more consistent party is the party that is willing to use more force because everybody is using coercion. The mixed economy uses coercion. Coercion is acceptable. So now it's just a question of who's willing to use more force, who's willing to stand up and use more. I mean, one of the things that makes the crisis in Ukraine, or the war in Ukraine, not a crisis, and the war in Gaza so important right now is that in both cases, the enemy is clearly evil. In both cases, Hamas and Russia have dedicated themselves to the destruction of Western civilization. They are clearly anti-enlightenment. They clearly want to destroy whatever remnants of enlightenment is. And as flawed as Ukraine is, and as flawed as Israel is, Israel less flawed, I think, than Ukraine, as flawed as Europe is, as flawed as America is, all of this still have those remnants of the Enlightenment. In all of those places, there's still hope of resurrecting, of re-engaging those ideas of the Enlightenment. The reason we should care about what happens in Israel is truly in Israel what's happening is you've got the remnants of Western civilization fighting against the barbarians who want to destroy it. And you've got the same thing in Ukraine. Ukraine was just turning towards Europe, just turning towards an enlightenment, just turning towards more reason, more individualism. Again, as mixed and as shallow as those concepts are in the West today, as, and that's the reason why Russia invaded. There's no, in my view, there's no question that Russia invaded because Kiev was turning more Western. Not because it was going to ally itself with NATO, but because it was going to ally itself with the West in every aspect. And if, you, if you've been to Kiev, if you weren't Kiev before the war, you could see it. You could see the young people striving to become more European and in that sense more enlightenment. And that's what Moscow could not allow to happen. So what you're seeing today in the world out there is very much the same battle that we saw in the 20th century. Just a continuation, just the forces now both on both sides are weaker, intellectually, philosophically, and less committed to the battle. Because, <laughs> I mean, the reality is that Israel could end the war in Gaza in days. The reality is that if NATO had supplied and the West had supplied the weapons Ukraine needed, they could have ended the war there the only reason these wars are ongoing is because our own lack of commitment to actually defend ourselves. The reason these wars are ongoing is because of the weakness that the West has in its own ideas and its willingness to defend those ideas. I mean, imagine Israel fighting like the Allies fought in World War II. I mean, there's no, I mean, it wouldn't survive more than a few days in Gaza, right? But nobody's willing to do that anymore. So we have two weakened enemies, enlightenment versus anti-enlightenment. And as much as we criticize our own governments, and I'm assuming here everybody is from decent countries, right? I think, I'm trying to think, yeah, pretty much. Not, no, we, that's right. We've got somebody from Hong Kong here because I haven't mentioned China yet. Um, but, but yeah, it, it, there is this constant battle between enlightenment and anti-enlightenment. And it's ongoing. It's been going on since the enlightenment happened. And the reactionary forces of religion rose up against it and secularized their anti-enlightenment views and have been coming at the enlightenment since then. And, you know, China's another example 
of it, it, this anti-enlightenment force, right? This anti-Western force. In the name of what? What is, what is the Chinese regime today uh, consolidating power and, uh, and repressing its people and taking over Hong Kong? What, what is it doing it in the name of? What ideology is it doing it in the name of? Kind of a vague nationalism. Well, it's not even imperialist. They don't really, be, you know, but it's like this vague. They, 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 they suggest a link to, to Marx. They want to pretend that there's some link to Marx. There's Xi Jinping's thought, the study now in schools. Nobody knows what exactly any of that means. When Mao's thought was studied, everybody knew what it was. It was, a, it was, a, it was clear-cut communism. This is kind of vague and unspecified, weak. But China's... A, Everybody's afraid of it because we don't know what we stand for. We don't know what we stand for. So the battle we're in is really a battle to save the good that we still have and to make it better because we know much better is possible. As good as things are in America, as good as things are in Europe, as good as our individual lives are, they could be so much better both personally as we integrate these ideas into our lives, but also politically as these ideas spread throughout the world. But one way to conceptualize this is to think about it in terms of these ideas of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment has to win for us to win. We are, in that sense, objectivism. Those objectivists out there that are, that are fighting to bring these ideas into the culture are fighting for the ideas of enlightenment. The ideas of reason, individualism, political liberty, individual rights. That's what this is all about. Enemies are pretty weak. It's not like they're strong. What is the concept that Ayn Rand uses to describe what's going on today in terms of why the enemies of the good are winning? Sanction of the victim. They can't win without us sanctioning them. Putin can't win without the West's weakness and to some extent, i.e. Tucker Carlson, groveling before him. Putin can't win on the basis of his own strength. He has no strength. Hamas cannot win on the basis of their strength. They have no strength. They can only win through Israel's weakness. They can only win through Biden constantly telling Israel to stop. The West constantly telling to Israel, now the risk is that if Israel actually executes on the war, they will be declared, what, war criminals, and any time they step on, in, Israel, in, in Europe, they'll be arrested. That is what gives Hamas power. It's our sanction that gives them power. It's our inability to support fully our side, the side of civilization. So, I think if we conceptualize what, you know, uh, uh, Ankar described today, you, you know, we're trying to train new intellectuals. We're trying to get objectivists and then intellectuals. Well, the war, the battle that we're trying to train those intellectuals for is a battle to save Western civilization. It's a battle to save the Enlightenment. Life is... It, it, the best that it's ever been, and it might be the best that it's ever been for a while still. But at some point, it will not sustain itself. At some point, the momentum will stop. At some point, if somebody doesn't defend it, the enlightenment will disappear. And the forces defending the enlightenment are very weak. And here I want to come to Millet, right? Millet, who is now the president of Argentina, surprising, <laughs> surprisingly, has been kind of a beacon of hope and a, and a beacon of lightness in a sense, right? Here's a guy who was advocating for a shrinking government, gave a speech, a, 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 you know, in many respects, an amazing speech at the World Economic Forum about the contrast between collectivism and individualism, how it's all about individualism and collectivism is evil. Uh, here's a guy who, who is completely uh, trying, at least, to uh, completely reform uh, the Argentinian economy and Argentinian political world and political culture. And I hope he succeeds. 
I mean, I really hope it succeeds, right? But the reality is that he's too early. He's too early. The world's not ready for that kind of change. And in a sense, he's not ready for it. He's still a mixture of a lot of good, but a lot of confusion and a lot of bad ideas. His talk at the World Economic Forum was, was pretty good, but when it comes to um, his moral defense of capitalism, which he tried to provide, it was pretty collectivist, utilitarian. Right? It's good for society. Capitalism is good because the poor do well. well. I mean, that's true. But that's not why capitalism is good. That's not what the morality of capitalism is. The morality of capitalism is the freedom of the individual to live his life based on his own judgment, in pursuit of his own values, in pursuit ultimately of his own happiness. Capitalism allows for that liberty. But Millet can't go there. He can't go there because he's not yet completely committed to these ideas of individualism and to these ideas of egoism, of selfishness, of self-interest. So he can criticize collectivism, but what's the alternative? The Enlightenment is still weak. It's still not ready for, you know, the, the full-blown is not ready for, main, you know, for, for prime time. And... If he did say it all, would he have got elected? I don't know. It's a Catholic country, Argentina. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't think he would. Now, and, I, and I'm not saying he held back anything, because I think he says what he believes. I, don't, I think he's just mixed. If you listen to his uh, CPAC talk, CPAC is the Conservative Political Action Committee, which is the big conference in Washington, D.C., that Trump spoke at and Millet spoke at, he spent like 15 minutes on why abortion is a left-wing conspiracy to, 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 to reduce the number of human beings on the planet. Talk about missing the point and about individ missing individualism and missing the concept of rights. I mean, it was a disaster. It literally was. The left has this conspiracy. They don't want a lot of people, which is true. But that's not why abortion is prevalent. It's abortion is prevalent is because women don't want to have a kid when they happen to get pregnant. They want to live their life. They have personal values. They're pursuing their happiness. But that is so radical. That is so individualistic. That is so requires a concept of individual rights and so requires a real understanding of the pursuit of happiness that he's too early. Too early. So I wish him luck, and I'm hoping to meet him. But, I, you know, I hope, I hope he succeeds in Argentina. But I just, it's not going to spread globally. This is not the beginning of, a, of some kind of free market revolution in the world. It ain't happening. And what's missing is that consistency. What's missing is, is that understanding. And I don't think Millet has it, and certainly the culture doesn't have it. And I don't think the culture is ready for it. And that's what we need new intellectuals for. What we need right now is to get these ideas into the culture. What we need right now is to convince people of the values of the Enlightenment reinforced with Ayn Rand, solidified by Ayn Rand's philosophy. We need objectivist intellectuals to go out there into the culture and prepare the culture for political leaders who will be far more consistent and will have traction in the population because of their consistency, because of their advocacy for rights. And we need leaders who can do that, not when the economy has 200% inflation and everything but is going bankrupt and it's the end and what the hell, let's flip a coin and go with the crazy economist, right, who, who is super radical. But because what these political leaders are advocating is true. We need new founding fathers in that sense who can change a culture and build a new political, political reality, a new political reality that is grounded in a proper philosophy and brings back the enlightenment ideas, that brings back reason, individualism, and real political liberty grounded on individual, individual rights.
Thank you. All right, we got time for questions. 20 minutes for questions. That's how I like it. So the microphone is here. No, you have to go up the mic. Right here. Get in line. Uh, the microphone for the questions is off. Oh, can I turn it on here? Can you turn it on? It's no. Oh, there we go. Okay, right. Um, so, I have observed a lot of people from different countries with, you know, my age and my education background. And one thing I really tend to notice is that good times create weak men. <laughs> yeah, like I, like I, I compare, uh, I, I compare most of the my Eastern European acquaintances and the, my American acquaintances, and you know, like, and my Eastern European acquaintances aren't into socialism; they aren't into pacifism, whereas most of my American acquaintances are so well defended that they don't know they are being defended. So, which makes me a little pessimistic. Like, do people have to learn? the lesson, the hard way, because if we're trying to achieve a better society and a better society, like how do we educate people on this sort of stuff without having people learn it the hard way? So, you know, people don't tend to learn from experience. If they did, China would be in a lot better shape than it is right now, right? The Chinese lived through Mao. Why are they want to reliving that? Why did they want to relive that, right? Um, the Eastern Europeans live through communism, so they know what they hate. But they also have the benefit of being next to Western Europe and seeing what's available and seeing what's possible and having the impact of Enlightenment ideas on them. Uh, now, it, America is weak, but it's not weak because it hasn't been authoritarian. It's weak because the ideas that made it great have gone undefended. Nobody is defending them. And it, doesn't, it shouldn't surprise anybody that the current election is between a nothing like Trump and a nothing like Biden. When over the last 50 years, we've had nothing intellectuals preaching nothingness, right? So there, there is no uh, intellectual support, intellectual reinforcement for good ideas in America. And those good ideas, and given the... the, the, the awful educational system in America, which is worse in many respects than I think the European educational system, you've just seen a deterioration in values, the deterioration in, in determination. I don't think it's the, the, the fact that they're not challenged uh, uh, you know, by nature right now, because the reality is that we mo most challenged by nature, life was tough before the Enlightenment, right? And it didn't lead. I mean, the dark ages were dark for a very, very long time, in spite of the fact that you think they'd be motivated not to be dark anymore. So it's, it, it's, that's not what motivates us. It's ideas that drive history. And ideas have been rotten for the last 50 years. So yeah, you get rotten people as a consequence. The advantage, again, the, the Eastern Europeans have is they've seen... The they, better. They've the seen better. worse, and they can look and they can see the better. So for a while, that'll hold them up. And, and you know, Poland right now is, uh, is doing fairly well, and they're investing hugely in the military, and th there's a clear reason why. Right? Putin is right there. And, and notice that the country he blamed for all their problems during his interview with Tucker was not Ukraine, it was not Germany. He actually gave the Nazis a pass. Who was it? It was the Poles. I mean, if there's one people that came across that he hates in that interview, it was the Poles. I would be investing heavily in, in, in tanks right now if I was Poland. So, but that won't last unless there's an intellectual foundation for it to last. So yes, for a while that'll keep them going. But they will surrender just like you know other countries are willing to surrender, have been willing to surrender in the past, if they don't have the ideas to, to bolster their, their self-confidence. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so I have a question that I've, I have debated about with a lot of objectivists. And 
I still haven't got an answer that satisfied me. So <laughs> there was Trump says repeatedly, and it was part of his campaign, I think, in 2016 and, and even now, that if the countries of Europe won't raise their defense budget to a certain percentage, which is agreed upon in the NATO's agreement, he will kick them out of NATO. And I've, I view this... Um, um, demand as completely fine. Like, why should America be an altruistic country and help countries that don't even pay for their, for their own defense? But a lot of objectivists tell me, no, we should defend. It's in this context to say it when Russia invades Ukraine and you can't uh, leave the countries of Europe alone. There's still remnants of freedom over there, and Trump is crazy, but I think this is pretty legitimate demand. So I don't think it's illegitimate demand. It just becomes illegitimate when Trump makes it because he's not making it on the basis of any kind of principle. I would even argue you could make a legitimate argument to say the United States should not even be in NATO. NATO should be an alliance of European countries to defend Europe, and they don't really need America. They're rich enough to defend themselves. And you guys are rich enough to defend yourselves. You don't really need America if you're willing to go out and defend yourselves. But you need to make, be able to make a principled argument for why, which is the exact opposite of what Trump does. right? So, no, there's no question that Europe uh, needs to pony up and defend itself better. It needs to depend less on the United States. The United States should so stop presenting itself as the defender of Europe no matter what, particularly when Europeans are not willing to defend themselves. I, I think all of that is absolutely true. It's just when Trump says it and the context in which he says it and how he says it, there's no principle behind it. There's no reason for it. He's just, you know, he, he, he got a good applause line when he went after NATO. So he, he went with it. But it, there's no belief there. There's no system of beliefs. There's no under strategic understanding of what is required. There's no understanding of the difference between Western Europe and Russia. There is a big difference between Western Europe and Russia. And Western Europe are basically... And there's no understanding of the fact that we are right now, whether we agree or not, we're in NATO. Which means that if Estonia tomorrow is invaded by Russia, the U.S., by treaty, has to defend Estonia. Does anybody think Trump would actually do that? I don't. So what he's really doing is not standing up for America. What he's really doing is trying to undercut Europe. So his motivation is not, this is what America's self-interest is. It's, I don't care about Europe. Hey, Putin, what did he say the other day? You know, if you want to invade them, fine. That's corrupt. And he is corrupt. I, I can agree that he's corrupt and I can see what you're saying, but... Still, I think when he talks about it, he does. Pro he, he says, we don't need to pay for countries who don't right. pay for themselves. Absolutely, because it's and a great applause line. I mean, I'm sorry, I've, I've watched Trump enough to know. Like he used to say, I saved us from COVID because I funded the vaccines. And the vaccines are amazing. And we saved millions of lives. And what happened? The audience booed him. Trump does not like to be booed. Now he's anti-vax. He's becoming, and he has lines, or, or he avoids vax completely because he knows, right? So he plays his audience, and the, and the line saying, NATO, those bad Europeans, they need to pay for their own defense. That got great applause line, as you would expect. So he's gone, he's gone all in with it. Okay. I mean, there's no, there's no actual strategy. I mean, it would be one thing if there was a strategy that says, here's what American self-defense requires. And part of American self-defense means we need to bring troops home. We need to stop defending Europe. They're rich enough to defend themselves. Let's, here's the steps that we should take. It's not what is going on. And, and look, his attitude towards Ukraine. I mean, here's a real, I think, a real existential battle here. This does represent Western civilization versus the barbarism that I think Russia represents today. And what is he, what, what is he suggesting? It's not just... You know, we shouldn't use American taxpayer money to whatever, which is, you know, you, it's, he doesn't care. If Putin wants Kiev, let him have it. That's the attitude. And that means, I, 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 I'm not standing with Western civilization. I'm, I don't care. I'm standing, indeed, he likes Putin. I mean, he, he, he admires Putin. He admires Xi. 
He admires the dictators of the world. So he has no positive view of Western Europe and even of America, in my view. He doesn't know what America is. He has no conception of America. That's why the whole America first is, or make America great again is such a, is such a ridic ridiculous. Because what does America mean? What is America? I mean, according to Tekka Carlson, it's beautiful scenery and God. But not according to reality. America is the land of the Enlightenment. America is the land of the Declaration of Independence. America is the land of the Constitution. It, it, t these people have no clue about any of that. So, just... Uh, We've got a lot of questions behind yeah, you. Uh, so, it just if you say the right things, but for the wrong reasons, they're not the right things. They're worse than the right things. Okay. They're worse than the wrong things. They're, the wor they're worse. Because then, because then the right things are associated with somebody who's really, really bad, with really, really bad fundamental ideas. Right. Okay. My question is uh, about if you think it is important uh, to know where to fight and how to fight. I mean, it is worth it uh, to fight uh, about, object, uh, about objectivism everywhere on the in Earth. But... Do you think that there are places on, on Earth that it is not worthy, and you think that you, we should go God instead of uh, give any effort on those cultures and leave them? L look, there's no. It, it depends what we mean by by fight for objectivism. If you're trying to change a culture, hmm. then yeah, there's some cultures that are more difficult than others. I, I think cultures that are, that are basically oriented towards Western ideas towards the Enlightenment are going to be, should be, easier to influence because there's already a certain orientation towards them. Uh, but, but that doesn't mean that in any particular case, and if you can't get to that part of the world, you should just give up on whatever culture you're in. Latin America, let's take Latin America, for example. Latin America is very influenced by, by continental philosophy. They had very little exposure to kind of the Enlightenment ideas There's a brief period with Bolivar. But, so it's much tougher because, in a sense, everybody there is some form of statist. And in America, there's still a certain level of what I might call the sense of life that is oriented towards individualism, and you can capitalize on it. So America is still, I believe, the best hope we have to change a culture. It's also a very big country, and that makes it really tough to have an influence on such a big country. There's so many intellectuals, there's so many forces. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd say fight where you can or where you want to or where you want to live. Don't, don't go, don't move so you can fight, right? If you want to become an intellectual and, you know, your native language is Spanish and that's where you write best and that's where you speak best, then find a Spanish country and do it there, right? It doesn't necessarily mean you have to You have to move to the United States, right? Or, 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 or to move to a particular European country. Find where your values are most attuned and do the work that you do there. You know, the mission, it's not, you're not supposed to sacrifice your personal values for the cause. Right? But of course, moving to America is not a bad idea, even beyond objectives, yeah. right? <laughs> Thanks for, so mo much. for most people, not all people, but for most people. Um, hi. So I like two points that you've made. That Putin is primarily motivated by hatred of the West, of the Enlightenment, reason, mm -hmm. individualism, capitalism, and the point that you made in the question period that uh, the country he, he blames the most and hates the most in Europe is Poland, um, <laughs> especially for me as a Pole. Uh, my question relates to the presidential elections. Uh, whom are you going to vote for and why? <laughs> I, uh, I live one of the great benefits of living in Puerto Rico is you're still an American it's still an American territory but you're literally not allowed to vote for president so I don't need to make a choice who would I vote for if I could not for Trump so I view Trump as the number one existential threat to America Another four years of Biden would be awful, horrible, disastrous, but not an existential threat. So um, I don't know if I could actually bring myself to vote for Biden. So I would either not vote or vote for Biden, but Trump, I would never vote for. Why? 
Okay, thank you. Who asked why? Because I said, I think Trump is an existential threat to the very nature of the American system of government, to the very nature of the country, and, and to the very nature of the ideas in the country. He is, he is a, uh, a, you know, he, by adopting the America first, by adopting this notion of make America great again, he is perverting the very nature of what America is and the very conception of America by associating himself with the flag and, 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 and with this great country, I think he undermines all the greatness that is there. He is the ultimate pragmatist, the ultimate, and I think an nihilist in the end, because what he really wants is to see what he perceives as his enemies, pretty much everybody, burn. He's not a builder, even though he's a builder, right? He's a real estate developer, he's not a builder. <laughs> Uh, he's, a, he's a destroyer, and, and um, so, yeah, I, I, I think, and, and you saw, you know, anybody who acted the way he acted after the last election should never be president. Just that childish, you know, emotionalistic, you know, disrespect for the entire political system. The rigging of it, they appeal to Pence to manipulate the system in order to somehow get him elected. This call to Georgia election, oh, give me another 17,000 votes, just give me, find them somewhere, right? I mean, somebody like that should never be allowed to be president again. I mean, it is so contemptible that he's even on the ballot. It is, a, it is, a, it is a, an embarrassment, should be an embarrassment in America that he's even under consideration. And it says a lot about the nature of American politics and the nature of the Republican Party today that they voted for him, right? Everybody will tell you, yeah, it's a two-party system. There's just two of them. Yeah, but there, there, there were like five, seven, eight, nine candidates. They chose him. All right, we have to go. Yeah. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask, um, well, all the rational people in the world, I, I mean, when the war in Israel started, you know, when everyone saw all the atrocities, I, I thought to myself, now there are pro pe probably people who are rational or semi-rational who kind of, who see that and say, and, and, and say, well, I can't defend it or I can't defend it anymore. And it was like, when at the start it was kind of like that and it didn't continue. So. Well, where are all the people? Where are all the people who have one foot in reality? They are riddled with guilt. So they might have foot in reality, but they won't stand up and declare it because they're afraid. They're afraid of the moral question. Look, the Palestinians must be the good guys. They're weak, and uh, you know they're, they're they're oppressed, and they're poor. And altruism demands that you side with them. And I don't think many people do side with them. But they don't side with them, but they're afraid to stand up against them because that would make them the opposite of altruist. That would make them self-interested. And it, it, they're riddled with and fear. Fear of that... You might want to step away from the mic because I, I don't know how it's resonating. But, um, yeah, it's, it's shocking and outrageous and stunning that so few people stood uh, by Israel after October 7th. And it's stunning that so many people went out immediately to side with the Palestinians and that the voices against them were ultimately muted. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, if I, can, if I can just, you know, just this, it, and I know this will offend some of you, but so be it. You know, a, one of the best reasons in the world never to call yourself a libertarian, <laughs> never to call yourself a libertarian, is the response of the American Libertarian Party and its, and its leaders to what happened. Because they didn't just not comment, they clearly sided with Hamas. And that is such a betrayal of liberty, of freedom, of the values of the Enlightenment that supposedly at some point, and one of the reasons I am much more sympathetic than Millet that I would be generally is that Millet didn't fall for that. Millet actually stood with Israel and this stands with Ukraine in opposition to the leaders of the Libertarian Party in the United States who have betrayed everything they supposedly claim to stand for, and this has shown them 
naked as anti-liberty, anti-freedom, anti-everything the West stands for. And they're full of the enemy, part of the enemy. So I'm all for getting involved politically and doing what you can politically, but the label libertarian was already tainted. Now, I don't know how you ever recover from that taint, and Nikos is saying, I have to stop, so thank you.